This video is sponsored by Status Audio and Status Between Earbuds. Get better audio and support the channel. In a world of AirPods and earbuds that have standard audio quality and poor battery life, music lovers are settling with how they listen to music. Status Audio is changing that. Status Between Earbuds are not only industry leading, but are the only triple speaker driver earbud on the market. What does that mean? Instead of having one shared driver for bass, mids, and treble, Status Between Earbuds have a dedicated speaker driver for each. That means you'll have cleaner, wider, and more powerful sound in every range of hearing across all audio. The difference is instantly noticeable and a game changer for audiophiles. Along with significantly improved audio through the triple driver, Status Between has 12 hour battery life in lightweight buds, an additional 36 hours in the case. On top of that, there are four built in microphones for improved call quality, two microphones on each earbud. Use the code GETROCK to check out and get 10% off your order. Audio file quality and a package and price that makes fidelity affordable and attainable. You can check out Status Between Earbuds and more of their products in the link in this video description. Some songs never age. Some songs age but are a good time capsule for the year they came out and can be remembered fondly. Then there are songs that age like milk the foul refuse that should be disregarded and should not have been acceptable in the past. This video is going to talk about 10 songs that aged badly. This is not a top 10, no ranking, just a list. Also only one entry per band because there are many artists who could fill up this whole list on their own. Finally, I have to be extremely careful when describing the content of each song, so I may use different words to explain everything so this video can stay on YouTube, but it'll be clear what each song is about. It will not be clear why the songs existed in the first place. This one's gonna be weird. You know how these videos work? Let's get to it. Back in the late 90s, Korn was doing great at the head of the new metal world, and Follow the Leader was huge in the heavy music world. The album went along just fine until it hit a track sounding like two middle school kids in the hallway were making fun of each other. All in the Family is intentionally a joke track for sure. Problem is that the joke wasn't even that funny then, and now it's awful. Even Jonathan Davis talked about how he hates it. In an interview with Metal Hammer, he said, It's horrible. We were all drunk in the studio, and I was trying to rap. At the time, we were having a good time, but now now I just cringe. I've got nothing against Fred, it just sucks. We were out of our minds drunk. It shouldn't have made the record. Lyrically, it's shameful. I applaud the condemnation of it now from Davis, and knowing that it was spawned from alcohol helps answer some questions, even if it's still inexcusable. All in the Family was a product of its time, the edgy junior high school insult era that was new metal. No Guns N' Roses problematic in some way? Not these little darlings. Many of you instantly understand that Axl Rose has made some music that is a bit inappropriate for um, anyone. Not to say that the music itself isn't solid, but sometimes Axl writes shockingly offensive lyrics because it's Axl and he's shockingly offensive when he's himself. Because he's one in a billion for better or worse. Back when GNR Lies was released, One in a Million started a lot of media backlash while fans defended the group to the death. The song is about Axel's journey from a small town to a big city, and on paper that sounds fine, but then you get to Axel giving massive amounts of bigoted terms. The song is rough to get through now and was removed from the big Guns N' Roses box set released years later. Axel Rose defended this as what he saw and heard when he came to LA, but then did interviews asking why he wasn't allowed to say racist words. The band caught backlash, which only fueled Guns N' Roses even more. I'm not saying Axel loves controversy, but Axel definitely loves attention. As for a song that is aged in a different way and is an 80s hit that everyone still knows the words to, Aerosmith were on their huge 80s comeback and Dude Looks Like a Lady was a feel-good hit everyone loved to sing along with. It was a big ol' laugh in the lyrics also back in 87 and for years to come. This whole song has not aged well at all. For many reasons, but not meant to be offensive. Inspired by Vince Neil. Yep, that's true. At a nightclub in the 80s, Steven Tyler saw Neil from behind dressed crazy, and he noticed his hips and figure. Neil turned around and Tyler replied, my God, that dude looks like a lady. I couldn't make that up if I tried. The song was co-written with Desmond Child, a famous songwriter and collaborator. He convinced Aerosmith to do the song because Desmond, as a gay man, was not offended by the idea and thought it was hilarious. Fair enough, but this song is not as cherished as much in today's A's for being seen as transphobic by many. 
And I admit, I sang along with it a lot as a kid because of Mrs. Doubtfire. Did I know what the lyrics meant? Not a chance. I was an odd little six-year-old. Speaking of the 80s, punk rock used to be the counterculture and intentionally shocking. Black Flag definitely fit that description as well. Not everything from the 80s era punk has aged like fine wine. Slip It In was described to me as incel rock, and when you hear the lyrics about women, yeah, there's an argument. There is objectifying women, there's slut shaming, and then there is this song, Slip It In. The song had a great riff, it's punchy, and wow is it degrading to women. If you heard a college kid even sing the lyrics of the chorus to this out loud, that kid would be maced, tasered, and probably banned from that student's campus. The cover art for the album also made things a bit worse for the general opinion. Black Flag was an important part of punk history, and many lyrics from Henry Rollins were intentionally shocking and raunchy. There are many defenders of this track saying it's addressing how many men see women and how it's about people and their choices. Regardless of the argument for or against, the lyrics themselves are still crude for how women are treated. When this song can be described as incel rock, yeah, that's a problem. The Rolling Stones are an inspiration, royalty in classic rock, and are no strangers to the occasional controversial song. What's wild is that Brown Sugar was a number one hit back in the 70s and was meant with good intentions from Mick Jagger who wrote most of the track. An iconic song with legendary guitar work that is no longer played live unless with changed lyrics and times have changed. Brown Sugar was a massive song for the group and it was about the horrors of slavery, abuse, black and white relationships, and it was all presented in a very raw, upfront way. Even the band is timid about it now. Keith Richards talked about how this song is no longer on the set list in 2021. He said, you picked up on that, huh? I don't know, I'm trying to figure out with the sisters quite where the beef is. Didn't they understand this was a song about the horrors of slavery? But they're trying to bury it. Odd response when talking about brown sugar, but that's Keith Richards. Shocker, many Hollywood Undead songs did not age well from the band's breakthrough album Swan Songs. The track Undead, the band's true banner anthem, is interesting though because one, it really got the attention and diehard fan base behind them, and two, this song was released in 2008 where people were starting to realize using homophobic slurs as insults was not a good idea. Didn't stop Hollywood Undead though. The band says it a lot too, just in this song alone and they put emphasis on it. The whole track is Hollywood Undead flexing on how tough they are and how mad they are at people, and then how everyone is mad and jealous at them. And yeah, I can see why dumb high school kids in 2008 saw this was awesome. In an interview in 2020, Johnny Three Tears said, we were young and angry and didn't mean what we said to be taken literally. But you have to take into consideration that someone else might take it literally and people might actually get hurt. There's certainly some regret there. Good thing they acknowledged the issue and they changed the lyrics to concerts now. How does it get more awkward? Go back to 1985 with Dire Straits. Money for Nothing is legitimately one of the most successful songs Dire Straits ever made. It's a song pointing out the people on and around MTV making tons of money for doing the bare minimum in music. Doesn't sound like it'd be wildly offensive, right? Can't imagine how a song like this could age poorly over the years. Money for Nothing is shockingly homophobic, racist, and sexist. It's a triple threat of awful. Back in the mid 80s, Mark Knopfler said the song was inspired by a delivery man seeing MTV on a television while he was working and said the delivery man was making a lot of the comments you hear in this song. Maybe that's not someone you should take inspiration from to make your recordings. Dire Straits would replace several words in the song as the years went on, but a lot of the meaning and derogatory comments are still there. Money for nothing. Wildly offensive and it was nominated for Song of the Year at the Grammys. Sounds about right. I talked about this song previously and my opinion has not changed. Winger 17 is awful. Just everything about it has issues. When you start reading the lyrics you start to feel dirty. Winger had a strong fan base and the late 80s were filled with this sound so why in 1988 did 17 make it so big? because glamorous guys with big hair love singing to the ladies, even if those ladies were high school seniors. Kip Winger said years ago that when he wrote the song, he did not know it was illegal to have relations with a 17 year old. That might have been the case, but also that's not going to lead to an acquittal in the courts or in general opinion from the public. 
that's a bad winger. Winger would play with changing the title to 18 when performed live in later years, and maybe they should just not play the song at all. I mean, that sounds like it'd solve a lot more of the problems. I'm not knocking Winger's overall talents, but there are better Winger songs out there and performances, and this one is just awkward. And 17 is always too young. Well, I guess it's time to go further down an awful rabbit hole that no one should look into. Kiss are icons of rock, though, through the decades. Go way back to 1977, and you'll hear the gentleman of Kiss, who all the women loved, write a song about being obsessed with a 16-year-old. Now, if this song was sang by any other high schooler, it'd be sweet, right? Well, it's not. I think you know it's not also. This one's hard to think about. Ugh. Another reason it's unfortunate is because I like the music and the flow of the song, but then when you think about how it's coming from Gene Simmons towards a 16-year-old girl literally leaving school one day, I really can't see how people are defending this one. But when I saw you coming out of the school that day, I am not saying any more lyrics from this song. Nope. When boomers get mad at the younger generation with the whole back in my day music was actually good, point them to this and how their generation was singing along to the lyrics of Christine 16. I'm not sure what you want me to say here. You all know Ted Nugent is awful. Not just a bad singer and writer, but just a flat out monstrous person who in my opinion should have been in jail years ago. When he was 32 years old, 3-2, he wrote a song called Jailbait and was not shy about describing what he likes. There are people in Florida that still support this man. Another reason for people to make fun of Florida. Don't Google the lyrics. You'll end up on a list somewhere. And it'll most likely be the list Ted Nugent is on. And there will undoubtedly be some extreme right-wing Ted Nugent defenders in the comments talking about how much he rocks and how this song might have a different meaning. No, it, it doesn't. He made it clear in the song and in his real life. All of Ted Nugent's material has aged poorly in my opinion, but I feel this should not have been allowed even back in 1981. They played this on the radio. Nope, that's not okay. If you're trying to defend Ted Nugent with the comment, it was a different time in the 80s, I'm pretty sure most rock music had better singing and playing and did not talk about the same material Ted Nugent does in this song. Side note, the following track on that album that Jailbait is on is titled, I Am A Predator. Ted Nugent is awful and if you defend him, you are insane. I think I've made my point. Also, I want credit for describing this Ted Nugent song without verbally describing everything word for word and keeping this YouTube friendly. That's difficult. And that was a look at 10 rock songs that age badly. I now would like to take a shower and melt a layer of skin off. Big thanks to my patrons and a special thanks to Chris Doman and Dom Noble. You can have a say in upcoming videos, get weekly new music playlists, and see videos early by supporting Rocked on Patreon. Please click the link in the video description for more info. Please subscribe and ring the bell to get notified of upcoming videos, and you can keep up to date with Rocked on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. If you are going to leave your suggestions on songs that age poorly, please remember that YouTube censors and filters out a lot of comments with extreme language. Just a heads up, because I have a feeling this video comment section will have many examples of that happening.